The Politics, Politics, Politics program brought to you as always by everybody who supports us. It takes, take politics seriously. Take politics seriously. That's where you go. Brings you to the Patreon. There on the Patreon, you can uh, choose to support us. And you want to know what? If your budget dictates, if your budget dictates that you can support us for $3 a week, I mean, think about what $3 a week is. It ain't really all that much. You spend uh, $3 for a lot of dumb shit. If you can instead not only get the the self-assurance that you are keeping independent political media alive outside of the corporate structure is the only place where I can do a show this silly. Well, for your troubles, I'm also going to give you a bonus podcast on Monday. I'm going to give you a bonus podcast on Friday. That means that we are at three podcasts a week base. And that's before we get into the interviews that we've been doing. And we might have a little Patreon level coming for that, too. Stay tuned. Head on over there. TakePoliticsSeriously.com. And by, hey, you want to come see me live? You want to come see me live? Well, you can. If you are in Austin, Texas, I mean, hell, even if you're in the surrounding environs, I'm talking talking uh, San Antonio, Waco, Dallas, Houston. I know what them drives are like. You can come on down, baby. March 9th at the North Door Theater. It is South by So Wasted, a comedy extravaganza featuring myself and Brian Brushwood performing as Night Attack. We have flown in the Las Vegas comedy trio, Ice Cream Social. They do an amazing podcast. They'll be there live. How about musical performances by the Possum Posse and Dual Core? Oh, how about special guest appearances, including politics, politics, politics guest Andrew Heaton. He is going to be live in Austin. Man, it is going to be an absolute blast. Get your tickets right now. Podcastlink.com slash night attack. Again, podcastlink.com dot com slash night attack but enough of talking about how we support the show what do you say we just do the damn thing wait no we just do the damn thing it didn't work here we go do the damn thing Oh. Ladies and la 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 ladies and gentlemen, 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 gentlemen. Oh, holy crap! Somebody done stole my corn pipes. You like that? As a uh, as a catchphrase, somebody done stole my corn pipes. Yes or no on somebody done stole my corn pipes. Go ahead and hit me up on social media and let me know if somebody done stole my corn pipes is something that you would like to hear more of. Friends, welcome. We've got so much to talk about. We've got so much. Uh, uh, just a, a, a cornucopia, an embarrassment of riches. Sometimes when it rains, it pours, and indeed it did. Pour manna from heaven today as we uh, we had a, a huge uh, hearing. We're going to break down in depth. Uh, we've got the 2020 uh, Democratic primary a rolling already. A, a mixed week for Bernie Sanders. A pledge by Elizabeth Warren. The top Democrats are now asking the field to sign a non-aggression pact. Don't be mean to each other. Plus, we're going to talk about Amy Klobuchar's salad eating technique. We're going to talk about the Trump tax cuts, the Vietnam summit, and Alex Jones going on Joe Rogan's podcast. All that with a pole dance and your emails. But there is no place that we can begin better than the Cohen hearing. (laughs) <laughs> oh, Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen. 
Now, when I call Michael Cohen a criminal liar, that's not me being uh, hi hyperbolic. That's not me being somebody that that is that is trying to to cast aspersions on the man. Like he is literally he's going to jail for lying. That's why he's going to jail. So the question isn't if he is a criminal liar or not. The question is, do you believe him now? It's it's so funny because everybody's thought Michael Cohen was a piece of shit at some point. It should be the one thing that binds us, right? Across all political spectrums, across all ideologies, there is one thing that we all know that at some point, either hither or yon, we believed Michael Cohen was a lying sack of shit. <laughs> either you did before and now you think he's telling the truth or you thought he was telling the truth before and now you scorn him as a liar. But he came out swinging. This was in front of the House Oversight Committee today. Big old hearing. Man, alive. everybody got their shit in. Everybody got to talk. We began with a statement of purpose. This is Michael Cohen reading off his prepared statement in which, uh, well, tells you everything you need to know. I am ashamed that I chose to take part in concealing Mr. Trump's illicit acts rather than listening to my own conscience. I am ashamed because I know what Mr. Trump is. He is a racist, he is a con man, and he is a cheat. So there we go. A racist, a con man, and a cheat. There is zero question in my mind that this is political. Michael Cohen is a political opponent of Donald Trump right now. He is not simply somebody that is revealing evidence in whatever myriad cases now find, uh, uh, you know, encircling around the president. He is there to score political points. And you know it because of that statement. There is no reason for him to call him a racist if he is just bringing evidence about how he paid off Stormy Daniels. There is no reason to call him a racist if he is just pointing out that there was connection between Russia and the Trump administration. He calls him a racist because... There's political context to call him a racist. Now, he might also be a racist, right? I mean, that's that is up for your own your own decision making. But there is no doubt that Michael Cohen is positioning himself as a political opponent to Donald Trump, to his ex boss. There's no question about that. I, I don't I don't see how that could be questioned. He is not just somebody coming in off the street and saying, Well, here's what I know. To be fair, the, the, the statement that he read felt very much, felt very much like that was the most organized part of it. It read, well, like a little bit more like I've heard Michael Cohen's lawyer talk. Then I've heard Michael Cohen talk. We'll get to that in a second. But you want to know what? Michael Cohen did make this point. He said, look, I'm not asking you to believe me. This ain't me coming in hat in hand and saying, please believe me. He's got those receipts. He's got that paperwork. He brought in bank paperwork showing that he took out $130,000 uh, out as a home loan. To pay off Stormy Daniels. Then he showed a $35,000 check signed by Donald Trump and another signed by Donald Trump Jr. Which of course proves beyond a shadow of a doubt. Not that much. I mean, Donald Trump's going to say, yeah, I wrote him a $35,000 check. He was my lawyer. I wrote him a lot of checks for a lot of different things. 
He was my personal lawyer. I paid him money. It's not like he wrote in the in in, in the field in the in, in the notes field, paying off my side pussy. Like he didn't write that in the in in the notes. Like so, Donald Trump's going to deny that there is a connection between those two things, and yet Michael Cohen shows it, and he is saying connect these dots. So don't believe me. Here's the paperwork. Believe me that these two pieces of the puzzle connect together. Now, what about Russia? What about Russia? Michael Cohen would know where all these bodies are buried. After all, he was the personal fixer for this man, both before, during, and after his political campaign. He has to know where all these dots do connect. Is he connected with Russia? Well, that actually includes uh, Don Jr. as well. Don Trump Jr. came into the room and walked behind his father's desk, which in and of itself was unusual. People didn't just walk behind Mr. Trump's desk to talk to him. And I recall Don Jr. Leave, leaning over to his father and speaking in a low voice, which I could clearly hear, and saying, the meeting is all set. And I remember Mr. Trump saying, okay, good, let me know. What struck me as I looked back and thought about the exchange between Don Jr. and his father was first, that Mr. Trump had frequently told me and others that his son Don Jr. had the worst judgment of anyone in the world. And also that Don Jr. would never set up any meeting of significance alone. I mean, his point is, his point is that Don Jr.'s a fucking idiot. How do I know that Donald Trump and Russia were connected? Because he would never in his life trust his idiot son. He would never in his life trust his idiot son to do anything by himself. There's literally nothing that that kid could do. There's nothing that that kid could do. That, uh, that, that Donald Trump would not have to hold his hand. <laughs> that's, the, the, that's the connection. That's the bridge. The bridge is, I know for sure that that meeting, which had the email subject line, uh, uh, dirt on Hillary with a, a, a connected Russian person, had to involve Donald Trump because Don Jr.'s a goddamn moron. And Donald Trump told me so. <laughs> oh, but you want to know what? If that wasn't sassy enough for you, oh, friends, things got even sassier. When I say shit got personal, oh, baby, oh, baby, did it get personal. This is, uh, for whatever reason, Michael Cohen deciding that he was going to comment on Donald Trump's service in Vietnam. He finished the conversation with the following comment. You think I'm stupid? I'm not going to Vietnam. And I find it ironic, Mr. President, that you are in Vietnam right now. <laughs> and he's not lying. <laughs> Donald Trump is currently in Vietnam. Uh, he might be in his own personal emotional Vietnam, uh, suffering the slings and arrows of this hearing. And he is almost certainly in a media Vietnam in that he would like for everybody to be talking about his summit with Kim Jong-un. And instead, all he's going to do is turn on international CNN and see that hang dog expression of Michael Cohen up on his uh, uh, television. But it's certainly shit was personal. Shit was a little personal, right? <laughs> like there's no, again, there's no context. There's no context in in the reasons why he is there talking to congress there's no context to bringing up whether or not donald trump dodged the draft in vietnam nor is there context to him mentioning the fact that he's in vietnam now but but you know michael cohen is now a political opponent and from there, 
uh, uh, Michael Cohen started to face questions. Questions uh, uh, friendly in nature from the Democratic representatives and uh, combative in nature from the Republicans. Here were some of my favorite of the Republican quotes. Cohen found himself defeated with logic. Here is consummate family man Paul Gozer. Remember, he was the one that had all five of his siblings take gigantic shits on him in that uh, in that in that uh, campaign ad during the midterms. This is the same guy. He uh, he hit up Michael Cohen uh, with this just devastating, ridiculously maliciously destructive bon mo come forward but there's no truth with you whatsoever that's why that's important to you to look up here and and look at the old adage that our moms taught us liar liar pants on oh no oh no my clip cut off it was liar liar pants on fire and he had a picture and he had a picture he had a uh, a, a, a photoshopped picture of liar liar pants on fire which is funny that he said that his mom taught them that because apparently his five other siblings also think he's a liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> but it wasn't the silliest thing. It wasn't the silliest thing that came out. No, I believe this was ranking uh, member Representative Jeffries reading off some tweets that were reportedly created by a Twitter account, Women for Cohen, because Michael Cohen was briefly thinking about running for mayor of New York City. So he was starting to build up his own profile, and uh, uh, he had a, a company or a woman that seemed to be in dispute during the hearing uh, uh, write some tweets just to, just to see the landscape to get everything set for Michael Cohen to make his own political debut, here are, as narrated by Representative Jeffries, some of those women for Cohen tweets. When you created the fake Twitter account, Women for Cohen, and paid a firm to post tweets like this one, in a world of lies, deception, and fraud, we appreciate this honest guy at Michael Cohen Hashtag TGIF, hashtag handsome, hashtag sexy. <laughs> hashtag TGIF, hashtag TGIF. And then what? What is Michael Cohen? Hashtag sexy. What was that? Hashtag sexy. What was, I mean, I, I can't hear you. I can't find that hashtag. Hashtag sexy. Wow. I wonder what you would find. Imagine you were online and you were searching for... Hashtag sexy. And instead you found Michael Cohen. How disappointed would you be? You would probably look at Michael Cohen's sunken fucking eyes and say, that is a million different hashtags, but it is certainly not... Hashtag sexy. That is one thing it is not, my friends. It is not hashtag sexy. Of course, Michael Cohen's reaction to that was, we were having fun. We were having fun. We were having fun. All right. This was a little bit of a, this is where we're going to end our sound tour here. Uh, this was, I think, uh, uh, maybe the most real moment. The most real moment in this entire this entire uh, 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 you know dog and pony show here. This is Michael Cohen uh, being asked, uh, "Hey, look, you've called Donald Trump a lot of things," and uh, being asked to reflect upon himself. Mr. Mr. Cohen, you called Donald Trump a cheat in your opening testimony. Uh, what would you call yourself? A fool. That's real. That's real. I mean, I'll bet you he does think that he's a fool. I don't think Cohen did bad, by the way. I have been making fun of him, but, um, you know, obviously he's going to be written off by the right as not credible, which he isn't. 
Uh, in fact, CNN, <laughs> CNN made a point to say, uh, oh, you know, he, he, he said he was asked directly whether or not he wanted a position inside the White House and if he was upset that he didn't get one. And he said, absolutely not. In fact, I, I made it clear to the president that not only did I not want a position in the White House, but also that uh, it would be against his interest if I had a position in the White House. And I think like the, the two reporters that are actually that actually report on CNN were like, well, uh, no, he definitely wanted a position in the White House. And he was definitely fucking pissed off when he didn't get one. You know, Republicans will write him off as politically motivated, which he is. I think it seems like it's pretty clearly. You know, the left are going to point to everything that he brought. They're going to say, forget trusting him. Look at these documents. It is yet more smoke that points to a fire that we are positive is literally right off frame. And aside from the very, very, very Lanny Davis sounding opening statement, like, by the way, just go back and listen to how Michael Cohen talks and then go back and listen in, uh, to Lanny Davis's media opportunities and then tell me which one of those two that that opening statement read more like. Like, just go and do it. Aside from that, though, Cohen sounded about as criminal as a uh, credible as a criminal liar can be, pushing back on further speculation about Russia. Uh, oh, by the way, he uh, totally torpedoed the fucking BuzzFeed uh, scoop from a couple weeks ago. Literally just came out and said, Donald Trump would never directly tell me to lie. I got my marching orders to lie, but uh, he that is not his style to uh, uh, tell me to lie. And he said, look, I, I, I can't know whether or not he absolutely colluded with Russia. I can have my suspicions, but I can't know. That, that, is a, that is a point of credibility for him. I mean, if he doesn't know. If he did know, then he should say it. But if he is saying he doesn't know, then at least it makes it a little bit more of a complex thing where he's not just totally selling out and, and coming off as a total shill. Although certainly he seems like he is now playing a political game that he didn't seem interested in playing before. Hence the Lanny Davis intro. But to talk about Michael Cohen is really to miss the point of this entire hearing. Because the reason why Michael Cohen was up there was not because he was going to be the John Dean piece that would bring along the modern Watergate. No, no, no. He was there so he could roll call. He was there so he could say names he could say names like don jr he can say names like ivanka trump he can say names like eric trump although not teflon tiffany good for her all of these people are going to get called which means we're going to get so many more hearings and whether or not Robert Mueller comes back with hard evidence that brings impeachment proceedings against the president of the United States of America. I think that it is ironclad that we are going to get hearing after hearing after hearing after hearing after hearing. Folks, if you know what I'm going for, then say it with me. This is going to be liberal Benghazi. Lock him up. Lock him up. Lock him up. Oh, it's never going to end. It's never going to end. We're going to be talking about this this whole Russia thing forever. Long past the 2020 election, if Trump gets reelected, we're going to be talking about it past then. This will never go away. And we're going to be there the entire time, folks. Free political newsletter at freepoliticalnewsletter.com is where you are able to keep up with everything that I think is the most important stories in politics. Five stories a day, five days a week, mostly if, sometimes hot takes. It's a real quick read. Thank you to everybody that has tried to keep us out of that dreaded Google algorithm 
By responding to the emails, it very greatly helps. If you have not done it yet, please go ahead and do it. Just uh, when you get the email, just send keeping this out of the algorithm. Give me any note you have on, on, on what you like, what you don't like. Doesn't matter what's in the response. It just matters that you respond. That way Google says this isn't just trash mail that we're going to put in promos or that we're going to put in your spam folder. It helps, helps, helps. Thank you to everybody who's done it. If you're not signed up, Go ahead and do it. Free political newsletter at freepoliticalnewsletter.com. All right. Bernie Sanders, man, he had a hell of a mixed week. Let's go ahead and start with the good. Bernie Sanders raised $10 million since he announced. Oh, hot chi ma chi. Holy shit, that's a lot of coin. It's the most that has been raised so far in the 2020 primary. It very much sets a yardstick up for Joe Biden, who is uh, would be the co-front runner if he ever got around to announcing. But that's big. That's very, very, very big. And, and uh, anybody who's not taking Bernie seriously, man, you need to start taking Bernie seriously. Uh, uh, you don't just raise $10 million doing nothing. And a lot of that have been uh, uh, new donors. They, they have been people that if if your your argument is there is going to be Bernie fatigue, at least according to the Bernie campaign, that does not seem to be the case. There are more people that are interested in Bernie as opposed to less. Here are the hard figures $10 million from 359,914 donors since launching last Tuesday. Uh, the average contribution was under $26. Expect that to be part of uh, his stump speech if last uh, uh, cycle was any uh, indication. Uh, uh, 48,000 have signed up to make recurring donations from their credit cards and more than 108,000 of the first day donors were 39 years old or younger, giving 2.5 million of the 5.9 million raised. 3 million of the first day came directly from mobile devices. Now, that's big. I've been on record. I came on record here yesterday and said that I believe that Bernie Sanders is going to win. I believe that Bernie Sanders is going to be the Democratic nominee uh, uh, in in 2020. But, but I did say it was a mixed week. I did say it was a mixed week, and here's why. Uh, within a week, within that 10 million, Bernie Sanders had a staff shakeup. A staff shakeup had to uh, part ways with uh, uh, two of his top strategists, this here from NBC News, and a major shakeup to the Bernie Sanders uh, just launched presidential bid. Some of his top strategists have left the campaign. Tad Devine, Mark Longabaugh, and Julian Mulvey, partners in a political consulting firm who played a leading role in Sanders' 2016 campaign for the White House, are parting ways with the senator, citing creative differences. The entire firm has stepped away. We're leaving the campaign. Longabaugh told NBC News on Tuesday, we just didn't have a meeting of the minds. Now, mind you, these guys' uh, specialty was creating a visual image for Bernie Sanders in 2016, including the big Simon and Gar Garfunkel commercial, America, which was, uh, by, by this man's judgment uh probably the best known uh, i i would say probably the best crafted commercial of 2016 it was very affecting it cemented the brand it, it led the image of bernie sanders in a very soft understanding uh uh you know aging hippie but like maybe we did forget the old ideas were important man like kind of vibe it was good it was a very very good ad and it really kind of uh, uh, uh set the ascendancy of bernie sanders going from a fringe political character to somebody in the mainstream 
Now, Jester Wood in our chat room says they wanted more money, and that might be the case. But, you know, when he's making $10 million, you might expect that he had money to give them. But I submit to you, maybe that was not the case. Maybe this was too many cooks in the kitchen. I bring you to this story from a few weeks ago. Bernie Sanders has recruited the media team used by uh, Ocasio-Cortez in her 2018 primary. Senator Bernie Sanders is recruiting a media production team that was used by uh, AOC ahead of her stunning primary victory last year, Politico reported. As speculation mounts that Sanders will launch another bid for the White House, his team is in conversation with Means of Production, a film production team based in Detroit that created viral videos for Ocasio-Cortez. Waleen Shahid, a spokesman for the Political Action Committee Justice Democrats, told Politico that means of production has proven that they're on the cutting edge of popularizing progressive, populist, and democratic socialist politics in America. So, if his old team was really good at crafting visual imagery... And you've got a team that literally just scored the most, they they just minted the most famous new voice in progressive politics. You know, if I were means of production, I don't know how much shit I would take from the old squad. And if I were the old squad, I don't know how much shit I would want to take from a team that has never played on the national uh, stage before. So I have no idea whether or not that's true. I have no idea whether or not that's true. Let me go ahead and point out that this is total, absolute, reckless speculation. I this is this is literally just me totally connecting two dots that I have I, I have seen come down the political news river. I don't know. It seems to make sense. Meanwhile. Elizabeth Warren uh, uh, made a statement of her own this week that she would out austerity the rest of the 2020 field. Indeed, she will not, not once, hold a big money fundraiser. Yeah, she ain't going to do it. She ain't going to do it. She's not going to hold some big money fundraiser. She's not going to do call time. She's not going to do call time. Call time is when a a politician literally just sits in their house and calls rich people. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. No, all of her events will be for people uh, who are donating uh, at all stripes. And and the only people she's going to call, the only people she's going to call are are the salt of the earth folks. People that are given $5, $10. Fifty dollars. In fact, I watched her do it on Instagram last night, calling random people, prank calling Elizabeth Warren, dialing up your phone. Hello. Hi, it's me, Elizabeth Warren. Is your refrigerator running? Oh, my God, you're a political hero. Yeah, but is your refrigerator running? Oh, my God, I really believe in you uh, taking these banks down. Okay, yeah, but. Is your refrigerator running? Oh, my God, I've donated to your campaign. Well, nevertheless, I'm going to persist in asking, is your refrigerator running? Yes. Well, you better go catch it. Ah. (laughs) Of course, this definitely means that Elizabeth Warren will keep her word. I believe her. She is not going to do call time. She is not going to hold these uh, 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 big ticket fancy pants. Uh, uh, fundraising uh, dinners. She's only going to solicit rich people via text. <laughs> you know, it's really easy to say that she's not going to do calls as soon as George Soros, uh, Soros installs WhatsApp on his phone. It's just like, oh shit, Soros is on WhatsApp? Sweet. Money sign? <laughs> Is Soros on Venmo? 
That's a lot easier. Just Venmo me that cash, dog. <laughs> oh, man. All right. I saw somebody in here say that uh, Beto announced he was not running for Senate. If, if, if that's a real if that's a story that uh, uh, has happened since I, I made the doc, then go ahead and throw that in the uh, throw that in the uh, in, in, in the chat. And I will break that news here as we record the podcast. Uh, all right. Uh, one more thing here. Uh, uh, top Dems have asked the front runners in the campaign, the Democratic primary, to sign a non-aggression pact. This according to Politico. Democratic Party chairs in fr- four early voting presidential states are working to convince the presidential candidates to avoid waging a social media war. Uh, and disinformation campaign against each other. The efforts began this week with a letter uh, to state party chairs across the country broadly laying out the issue with an ultimate goal of establishing what amounts to be a non-aggression pact, according to a copy of the letter obtained by Politico. We would like your support in recommending the ASDC, Association of State Democratic Committees, work toward developing a collaborative approach to battling disinformation, illicit campaign tactics, bots, troll farms, fake accounts, altered text, audio and video, and any and all inauthentic speech in our presidential primary process, wrote the four chairs, including those of New Hampshire, Iowa, Carolina, and Nevada. The Association of State Democratic Committees, the Democratic National Committee, and the presidential campaigns can and must work together in preventing the pollution of our discourse. Further, we want the campaigns uh, to commit to report illicit activity they uncover on social media platforms and when necessary uh, to law enforcement and and the Department of Homeland Security. So what they're saying is, if in the heat of a winner-take-all democratic knife fight they find that somebody that may or may not be inside their own circle is creating a uh, 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 issue where they are uh, benefiting from another campaign being hurt that that campaign the one benefiting in a winner take all every second matters process should go right to the authorities and say, stop me winning. Hmm. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it plays out for him. All right, guys. Uh, Let's go ahead and do something that I am very, very excited about. This is a new segment that I am bringing here to the Politics, Politics, Politics program. The... Parade of Wrong Opinions! So, uh, it seems like eating a salad with a comb is a very legal and very cool way to enjoy lunch. Wrong! Hmm. Amy Klobuchar. Amy Klobuchar uh, uh, <laughs> had a little bit of a little bit of a scandal on her hands. Brewing, brewing, simmering, boiling, almost like her temper. Apparently, people are, are bringing up the fact that she doesn't have the best reputation on the Hill for how she treats her staffers. Indeed, she can be uh, prone to throw fits and sometimes binders at them. But the story that stuck the most was that uh, uh, one time she was getting on a plane and her staffer came in to bring her a salad. But the staffer screwed up and uh, dropped the salad on or dropped the fork on the floor. So Amy Klobuchar decided that she was still going to eat the salad on the plane with a comb. With a comb. I don't quite understand why you would use a comb instead of just five second ruling that fork. Like, 
If I had to ask Amy Klobuchar one question, it would be, do you or do you not believe in the five-second rule? Because I think that anything that touches the floor, if you pick it up before five seconds, it contains no germs. Wrong! Hey, uh, uh, I haven't paid attention to this story uh, uh, in, in a while, but... Uh, Hey, all three of those dudes, those politicians in Virginia lost their jobs, right? Wrong! You know, like the blackface guy? Wrong! How about the sexual assault guy? Wrong! How about the other blackface guy? Wrong! So none of them lost their jobs? I would have uh, been sure that somebody would have paid a political price. Wrong! Oh. Well, thanks to the Trump tax cuts, at least 11 million people will see higher refunds. Wrong. Mm, this according to a financial watchdog. Apparently, the uh, SALT deductions, the state and local tax deductions, which uh, were affected by the Trump tax cuts, now will be uh, a problem for 11 million taxpayers. Uh, that means that they will be seeing less money that will come into them during their refund. Hmm. Well, I'm sure that will play really, 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 really well when 2020 rolls around. Wrong! Hey, Trump's Vietnam summit with Kim Jong-un is the number one political story of the week, garnering by far the most headlines. Wrong! How about Green Book was the best movie of the year and fully deserving of the best picture Oscar? Wrong! Alex Jones came off as a calm and rational person on Joe Rogan's podcast. Wrong! Oh, no. Screw it. I'm sick of trying to convince you people. What do you say we just go ahead and blow off some steam? Oh, yeah. You know what time it is. Ladies and gentlemen, it is how we like to handle all of our data journalism. Folks, this is the This is a morning consult poll for the 2020 Democratic primary. It was taken from February 18th to February 24th. We had to cut three people for this one, too. This was the whole field, but we're just going to go five wide. Coming up first to the stage. He is the man from Newark with 4% of the vote. Let's give a big round of applause for Corey Booker. With 7% of the vote. He may or may not be running for Senate. It is. Battle all right. Also, with 7% of the vote, you can save your call time money bags. She is a woman of the people from Massachusetts. It is Elizabeth Warren. With 10% of the vote representing the Bay Area, Kamala. But now, your headliners. 
with 27% of the vote. The top of his campaign might have left, but who cares when you're swimming in all that cash? It is 27% of the vote for Bernie Sanders! But atop of them all, swinging down this pole, as yet, officially unannounced, the man from Amtrak. He might be riding the quiet car, but it's loud as fuck up in this poll, Joe. That is Joe Biden leading the field with a two-point spread. All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get into but your emails. You can go ahead and send me an email anytime that you would like at theyoungamerican at gmail.com. Again, theyoungamerican at gmail.com. Ken writes, serious question. How do you think Bernie Sanders' look will affect his chance of becoming president? I don't mean to imply that you have to be handsome or bangable to win, but you do need to look presidential. Do you think he looks presidential? Whatever that means to each person, looks play a huge part in politics. Beto wasn't popular for his policy positions. He was popular because he was a handsome man. I would disagree. I think Beto did have some good retail politics, even if I wasn't a gigantic fan of his campaign. Although I do think him being a little bit of a little bit of a, a little, little little foppish moppet didn't uh, didn't hurt him. And I do believe that Bernie Sanders looks like a sentient sack of potatoes. But I don't know how much that matters. Or if that matters as much as authenticity does, which he has more than any other candidate. IMO. Clay writes, spot on without authenticity being the key factor. That's why Beto would win. I take Bernie though, that's all. Clay, I also believe that Beto is who he is. I don't think he's putting on airs. I think he is very authentic, which means he is authentically being a flighty, uh, 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 empty suit as he drives around the country and doesn't actually run his campaign for president. Rishi B writes, uh, The Academy picked Green Book for its best picture. One of the safer picks between that and A Star is Born, as Green Book is the story of bridging racial divides as opposed to picking the first foreign film ever, Roma, which would be a huge hit to the theater game. A movie heavily acted by women, the favorite. Uh, the best picture, The Academy, despite having a reputation of being the bastion of the most liberal liberalism that could ever be liberated, uh, selected shows IMO that the country, er, selecting Green Book, IMO shows that the country is not ready for the first gay president or the first female president. They want their carb-heavy comfort food. Old, white, male bread. Sure, we occasionally complain about carbs and go out for tapas, but at the end of the day, we just want to wear sweats and see Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders being a president, old, white, and male. I love this take. I love this take. <laughs> I love Green Book equals a white man will win the, the, the 2020 primary. In fact, I'm stealing it. Rishi, congratulations. You've just donated. I've seized the means of your take a production, and I'm now going to say it's mine for the betterment of everybody. 
Kyle in Green Bay says, here's the deal about Cory Booker's font choice. Oh, I was very, very interested in what font Cory Booker was using because it looked really weird. And so we, I got font knowledge here. It is San Francisco compact text with a heavy italic. The font is also compressed even further. It has a weird, almost futuristic look. I agree, Kyle in Green Bay. Thank you for being my font expert. Swervum writes, wanted to give you a quick update on the craziness that is currently going on in Canada. It has come out that the prime minister's office pressured the attorney general to allow a deal in a corruption case against an engineering firm, SNC Lavalin. After charges went forward, the AG, Jody Wilson Robolo, was removed from the office of attorney general and shuffled to a lesser cabinet position of veteran affairs. At, as this broke, Prime Minister Trudeau came out and said that he had told Wilson Robolo that the decision was hers and the fact that she was still a part of the cabinet showed that she didn't have concerns. The next day, she resigned. ruh -roh. It's a weird little scandal that may not have gone anywhere, but the perception is that Wilson Robolo is being thrown under the bus is creating issues for the Liberal Party in the progressive base. She is a First Nations woman who is heralded as one of the faces of Trudeau's inclusive government, so the white man in power was trying to push her around, did not play well with the progressives. For the first time since coming to power, it looks like there is a chance Trudeau may or may not manage to win the next election later this year. Oh, and the first person to lose their job over, his, uh, over this is Butts. I have no idea what that last part means, but cool. Jay writes, even though Trump Jr. has publicly indicated that he believed he would be indicted, uh, i.e. the famous I love it email, it appears Mueller uh, has held off going after the Trump family. Yet, as the investigation maybe draws to a close, do you think that this is just an investigative strategy not to cross the red line and have Trump become even more unhinged? Who else in the family do you think may end up facing Mueller? Ivanka, Eric, Tiffany, my guess is that Barron is relatively safe, but who knows? I add editorially, he is indeed a cyber wizard. Back to the email. Also, in honor of the Trump announcement for fireworks and festivities in D.C. on the 4th of July, any chance you'll give listeners an offer code for the free political newsletter. Ladies and gentlemen, contrary to popular belief and uh, a scurrilous rumor and innuendo, the free political newsletter is indeed free. It is not, uh, uh, it is, it is not, uh, does not cost $3, so knock that off. As for the Trump family getting indicted, if it's true that the Mueller report is wrapping up, then I do think it's unlikely that any of the Trump family, uh, gets indicted. But that's a total guess. I ain't got no idea. I'm not going to buzzfeed my own ass and just start making wild comments. Sean writes, I am loving the interviews. I think I learned that it's okay to say that BB's government pressures the U.S. to blow up the Trump deal. Trump's affinity for Netanyahu meant that Net Netanyahu could finally find a sympathetic government. I don't like how the Israeli government influenced the U.S. policy. I asked you now, did I get through all those without anti-Semitism? Far as I know, yes, you did. If you could find someone to interview about Klobuchar's management style and the fact that she's a woman, that'd be great. I think she is getting a potential bum rap because, number one, she's a woman, and number two, she's a Democrat. Women are expected to be softer in management style. Democrats are expected to be inclusive and nurturing. Uh, I would disagree with you there, Sean. I, I don't agree with you. Uh, by any and all accounts, Hillary Clinton was not the easiest person in the world to work for. And yet she did not have, on day one, stories of, I got a binder thrown at me. That would seem to indicate, and I believe it is, a, a, a gender progressive stance that women can be awful bosses too. There ain't no reason why they can't be the same kind of awful boss that we hear men uh, uh, be domineering, 
hot-headed, bullies, prone to outbursts. Seems like Klobuchar's got... I haven't read any of the Klobuchar shit that I think is off off base. I mean, considering... Again, like we had... Uh, we had a lot of women running this time, comparatively. And we haven't seen all of them face the, oh, they're all bitches. It's really just Klobuchar. And you got somebody saying that they threw, she threw a binder at him. And she got so stubborn about a dirty fork that she ate with her comb. So, yeah, I don't think she's getting a bad rap. But, hell, what do I know? Folks, you can go ahead and email me, theyoungamerican at gmail.com. Music has been provided by Valesco and Trap Killers. You can follow me at Justin R. Young everywhere. A reminder, you can support this show, takepoliticsseriously.com. That is where our Patreon lives. Go ahead and join that $3 club. Bonus podcast on Monday. Bonus podcast on Friday. That wraps it up for today, though. If you want to uh, find an old episode, go ahead and catch us at bonerwars.com. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, this is your old pal, Justin Robert Young, asking you, Please recognize that some shows talk about politics. Other shows talk about politics. Still more talk about politics. But this is the only show. The only show that talks about all three. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>